For those, for those of you who write books, this may be salient. The thing to notice about <laughs> The thing to notice about these, these is that what makes them funny, if they're funny, is how preposterous they are. And my point is that that they are preposterous is a contingent fact. And they may not be preposterous a few years from now. And they're not as preposterous now as they were a decade ago. <laughs> so the question is, you know, what's the future? How, what kind of future generation are we training? So, so given that, we live in a society, oh, and I think the economists deserve a lot of credit for this, in which market pricing is the dominant mode of social relation, justified in the name of efficiency. Uh, uh, what's the alternative? What argument can be made that, there is a, that, that we ought to make our relations with other people more differentiated and refined than this blunderbuss market pricing uh, model would otherwise provide for us. How do you choose? How do you decide what goes where? And I, I mean, frankly, I don't know the answer to this. Um, in connection with, um, uh, with issues of justice, Michael Walzer wrote a terrific book 20 years ago called Spheres of Justice, in which he argued that what counts as just is very much domain dependent. Equality in some case, desert in other cases. There are, there's room for dis dispute. Things change, but we have a nuanced, rich, differentiated notion of what's just. And different conceptions of justice operate in different domains of life. That's a, that's a, a nice approach to take, except that's all with respect to the question of what is just, which is, a much more, which is a more specific question than the question of how should people relate to one another. Justice is not the only consideration when you're asking that question. But something, an analysis along the lines that Walls are offered in connection with justice would be a good place to start. You could try to do a cost-benefit analysis. What's the consequence of having people treat family relations as market relations, or relations with neighbors as market relations, or market relations as authority, authoritarian relations? You could do some sort of cost-benefit analysis and come up with a scheme that, makes, that tells you what the most efficient way is to organize our social relations into these different categories. The problem with this, I think, is that you doing a cost-benefit analysis can crowd out concern for things like justice because cost-benefit analysis has built into it the tools of market pricing. You are, in effect, using the tools of the dominant mode of social relations as a way of assessing whether the dominant mode of social relations should be the dominant mode of social relations. And as they used to say back in the good old days, you don't expect the master to knock down his own house. Um, so that's, I don't, I have nothing else to say about how to make these decisions than uh, do, look at what Walzer did and don't use cost benefit analysis. And this brings me, since this is a law school, to my amateur outsider's uh, sense of the, of the um, perils and pitfalls of the law and economics movement. And I could have this all wrong, but my sense of what the law and economics movement is mostly trying to do is introduce a little bit of concern about costs, benefits, and efficiency into a domain that is uh, excessively concerned with things like justice. You know, let's get our hands dirty and figure out how much it's going to cost to make sure that justice is done in this or that case. We won't get carried away with it. We'll, uh, we'll, it'll only, it'll only in, in influence our decision. It won't determine it. And somehow, co cost-benefit consequences get, get weighed along with justice consequences. The problem is, how do you measure costs and benefits? In, if, uh, I mean, there's one problem is that it's possible that this gets you on a slippery slope. Uh, and the more you think about costs and benefits, the less you think about justice. That aside, how do you measure costs and benefits? There is a gold standard for measuring costs and benefits that we've inherited from the economists. It's known as contingent valuation. You ask people, how much would you pay to have your lake cleaned up, or how much do I have to pay you to pollute your lake? 
and that's a way of assessing what the collective costs and benefits are of a social policy or in the case of a legal case, a, a judicial ruling. So this is the best way of assessing the welfare consequences of any policy or any decision. And here's the problem. There are many problems with contingent valuation, but I'm only going to mention one. The study in which in Switzerland, where they went around asking people, would you be willing to have a nuclear waste dump in your neighborhood? That was just a way of asking a contingent valuation question. And when you ask a contingent valuation question, you get the impression that nobody is willing to be public spirited. So the, what seems to be a neutral question designed to assess welfare is in fact a non-neutral question that pushes people in the direction of asking what's in it for me rather than what are my responsibilities as a citizen. I think this is built into contingent valuation, which again is another way of justifying market pricing as the framework for understanding how people relate rather than uh, uh, assessing the welfare consequences of various decisions. Last point. Whoop. Nope. Can't go back. <laughs> Done. Thank you. <laughs>